So in our Global Trends panel this morning, one of the key priorities identified uh, by our panelists was to strengthen democracy. So we want to talk now in our discussion on these different dimensions of power, we want to talk about the power of democracy in Europe and beyond. Uh, and I'm going to for this one, have a conversation, and I am hoping he will magically appear on my screen in just a moment. I'm going to talk to Ivan Krashchev, who is chair of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia and co-author of The Light That Failed, which is a prize-winning book on Central European politics that many of you, I'm sure, may have read. Uh, Ivan is joining us today from the United States, uh, so we are very pleased uh, to have him with us. Ivan, very warm welcome. Thank you for being with us today. And Ivan, if we could start, if I could just take you back to where we started our conversations uh, this morning at the conference about the Ukraine invasion as a watershed moment. And the EPC has done a lot of work in highlighting just how much of a watershed it is and what the implications are across a huge range of areas uh, for the European Union, indeed for the world. Just for you, how much of a watershed do you believe it is? Can anything ever be quite the same again, if I can put it that way? Thank you very much. Uh, great pleasure to be with you. And just to correct you, unless uh, Vienna has become uh, part of the United States. Ah, uh, I was told I'm you were joining there. us from the US. I do apologize. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, but uh, uh, but the, the, the story is that I do believe it is a real trash fault. I do believe that also basically the Ukrainian war came up at the top of some previous crisis that had been shattering uh, uh, Europe and the world. And from this point of view, it's true that we have been saying that the world is not the same several times after the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, but this time, I really uh, personally are convinced that the world is not the same. And we are we are kind of witnessing and we are part of a very critical shift, uh, both on the level of our societies internally, but also on the level of the global politics. Thank you. And, and in terms of the power dynamics, we're spending the whole day talking about this new era of global power politics and how it's changing things in so many ways. How do you believe it will redefine and change power dynamics within uh, Europe and within the world? Uh, let's try uh, about the world. Of course, uh, when all this big crisis started, one of the major story was which of the two political systems are going to perform better, democracy or authoritarianism? And this was the key, the question that had been asked in the early days of the COVID crisis. This was the case that we're asking now. And of course, there are too many different democracies and too many different authoritarian regimes in the world. Uh, but one of the interesting things coming out of these two big uh, crises, I mean, both uh, COVID and Ukraine, is that probably in the last 10 years, there was a tendency to overvalue the strengths of some of the authoritarian regimes. Uh, China, which ended, which started very strongly trying to convince everybody that they can discipline society as a response to the COVID, uh, now is the country that basically is becoming one of the biggest victims uh, of its COVID policies. And here you see one of the major weaknesses of any authoritarian regime. Uh, you can implement policies uh, and you can be quite effective in this, but you don't have much of a capacity to change policy if your initial policy was wrong. And while well, democracies have been kind of a modeling through and some are doing better than others, at the end of the day, now when you compare Europe with China, we can be quite confident that Europe did better as a response to the COVID crisis than the Chinese. And when it comes to the war, before the war in uh, Ukraine had started, there was the story that while the Russian regime is uh, very authoritarian, but you have this strong political leader, they can do things. And to a great extent, that uh, Russian soft power was very much rooted in the Russian hard power. The idea was that probably Russian economy is not overperforming, but Russians were quite successful in their intervention in Syria and other places that they have kind of a will to project their power. And what we're seeing in the last nine months is not simply that, that basically Russia went into the war, which was a major 
on one level crime, but on the other total strategic mistake. Uh, but secondly, that we have been misreading uh, the nature of the Russian military power, that uh, basically uh, the Russian army is at the moment uh, very much stopped defeated by the Ukrainians. And this shows that in this balance between democracy and totalitarianism, uh, to a great extent, basically democracies have the reason to be much more self-confident that they they have been two or three years ago. Uh, on the other side, I do believe in the world as a whole. And from this point of view, the uh, uh, Russia's invasion in Ukraine was a great example of this. Probably we're making a mistake if we believe that we're simply going back to the Cold War in the way some of us remembered it uh, from some 30 years ago. Because while the confrontation between the West uh, and Russia, between democracies and authoritarianism is very much what we witness in Europe, if you see around the world, you're going to see that responses much more fragmented and much more different. The majority of the countries that President Biden invited on his summit of democracies do not sanction Russia you're going to see that some of the important kind of America's ally outside of Europe has been reacting very differently. India staying on the fence and basically trying to maximize its economic interest. Uh, Saudi Arabia basically following uh, oil uh, policy, which is uh, very much supportive for the moment, much more for the Russian side than the Western side. Why I'm saying this? Because in my view, what we're seeing in the world is what I'm going to define as the rise of the middle powers. Well, during the Cold War, the two superpowers, back then it was the United States and Soviet Union, now we can much more see this as a conflict between the United States and China, were able to consolidate very strong commercial, political, military blocks, and everything that is happening was very much framed and disciplined in this confrontation. Now we see a world in which different type of middle powers are trying to find their own their powers, they're trying basically very much to shape their regions. And as a result of it, the superpowers like China and the United States are much more managing the activism of the middle powers than basically being able simply to be the leaders of well-established blocs. And from this point of view, the behavior of Turkey, which is a very important uh, uh, factor in uh, the Russia-Ukrainian conflict is quite a clear example of this. Turkey very much basically chose the role of um, mediator between Russia and Ukraine, while very much condemning uh, Russia's invasion. But in a certain way, we see this in many other parts of the world where these middle powers are really trying to strive for relevance. And while they're not kind of a united bloc, they're very much different, uh, but uh, they're not ready anymore simply to look for some alliance security guarantees. They're much more trying to maximize their room for maneuvering. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to come picking up on your point about the battle between democracy and authoritarianism. Herman Van Rompuy, in his opening keynote today, talked about, he said, parts of the population feel no power, but only powerlessness towards their elected representatives. And 30%, 37% of Belgians think a good dictatorship is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and I just really, in, in terms of this rise of illiberal democracy, do you anticipate that it will spread? And if you do, what can be done to counter it? Listen, it's an interesting question because normally we try to come a general answer. And this trend uh, is going to have a different answer in different parts of the world. People feel really very much deprived of power because we more and most have the feeling that we are living in the world that we don't understand anymore. Mm. Uh, and this is very strong, because if you don't understand the world, obviously you don't have the feeling that you have the power to change it. And secondly, for different groups of the population is that many things that for them are obvious, many things that for them are desirable are not happening. Uh, I was listening uh, to the end of the previous uh, panel, and on one level, basically, there are people who really believe that everything should be focused on fighting the climate change. On the other, there are people who believe that their countries are too poor to care about uh, any type of a climate change. And both of these people have disempowered in a certain way. Uh, and the problem with a good dictatorship is uh, it's a great idea. Listen, probably we all are going to be in favor of the dictatorship if we're going to be assured that we're going to be the dictators. Uh, but the story was that this is the only assurance that you cannot get. Uh, and the biggest problem of the democracies from this point of view, at least I can get it wrong, is not so much the authoritarian temptation 
But this rise of the level of mistrust to the level that makes democracies ungovernable. And you can see this on many levels. You can see this basically with an incredible spread of uh, conspiracy theories. You're going to see it on the level of high polarization, particularly in places like the United States, but you can see it in Europe, Poland is such an example. So from this point of view, suddenly you have the level of fragmentation that makes it very difficult to take any decisions. And this kind of a crisis of cohesiveness of societies is what, in my view, is a major threat to democracy. And all this kind of idea that the leader is going to come and by the fact that you have this leader, you're going to recreate the cohesion that we have been lost. Uh, in my view, it's very illusionary, but of course, uh, it's easy for the people to go for this if they don't believe that anything else is uh, uh, is doable. But illiberal democracies are not overperforming too. And you can see certain developments uh, in Hungary when it comes to economic and other policies. Uh, I don't believe that uh, people who basically uh, voted uh, or have been admiring in Europe, uh, President Trump, uh, feel particularly encouraged uh, by what they have uh, got. So we in this I will, very difficult period in which it's not enough for people to believe that democracy is a better uh, form of government than the autocratic regimes. They want something different. They want democracies that works for them. Thank you. And you mentioned Hungary, so this would be a good moment for me to ask you uh, your assessment of where we are in terms of the rule of law debate, uh, both in Hungary and in Poland. And we'll come up back, back to Poland more generally a bit later. But the European Commission announced yesterday uh, that it wants to withhold 7.5 billion euro of funds from Hungary, saying you made commitments on reforms, but you haven't delivered yet. Surprise some. Many people thought the Commission was going to take a much softer line. What what is your assessment of the EU's response to Hungary and indeed to Poland and whether it's doing enough, needs to get tougher still? Um, how does it, and particularly at a time like this when we bring Poland into the equation with the situation in Ukraine and so on, how does it square the circle of keeping very important country like Poland on side with defending its fundamental values? Squaring the circle is now easy. And from this point, the European Union is facing a major tensions between the idea of a geopolitical Europe. And in the case of the Russia's war in Ukraine, this geopolitical Europe very much depends basically on the strength of the eastern flank. And people cannot kind of over underappreciate what Poland has achieved on the level of basically giving a very strong support to Ukraine and also has hosting uh, millions uh, of refugees coming uh, uh, from Ukraine. Uh, and, and this is, listen, this is a reality. Seven to eight percent of the households in Poland have been hosting uh, uh, Ukrainians in a moment in which the prices are going up. Poland is not the wealthiest country in the European Union. So you see a level of solidarity and sacrifice coming from a country which just uh, several years ago was not ready basically uh, to host uh, several thousand uh, people coming from uh, the Syrian war. But at the same time, basically exactly because East European countries are so important for the geopolitical unity of the European Union. The problem is how tough the European Union can go on the rule of law. And here, paradoxically, Hungary uh, turned to be a much more vulnerable uh, than Poland because uh, Hungarian government uh, decided uh, to kind of position themselves as uh, the most uh, Putin-friendly regime within the European Union. This created a major kind of a division within the European Union. And while Poland, of course, is supporting uh, to a certain extent Hungary in its opposition to Brussels. It's very clear that the Visegrad 4 basically is not functioning anymore. It's very much Visegrad 2 plus 1 plus 1. Uh, and in this situation, in my view, there was an opening for the uh, for the European uh, Commission because the European Commission had a very strong message and the message was even if in this moment kind of a unity, if Hungary is challenging not only the rule of law, but also the geopolitical priorities of uh, the European Union, should we stay soft? And in my view, the Hungarian government is starting to understand that they're getting in isolation. Hungarian government very much betted on a major change in the United States 
states and a big victory of the Republican Party on the midterm elections. And because this also did not materialize, uh, you can see that the response of the Hungarian government uh, to basically the proposals of the commission and possibly the position that is going to be adopted is much more measured than basically many of the things that they traditionally do when they want to show how unhappy they are with the position of the European uh, mm -hmm. Union. And this is also important because at this moment, also Hungary is quite vulnerable. Hungarian government invested a lot of money in order to win the elections. And as a result of it, inflation is going uh, quite up. So I do believe paradoxically this crisis on one level is a risk because the tension between the rule of law and uh, the uh, basically the unity, the geopolitical unity of the European Union is real. But on the other side, paradoxically, then also can come as an opportunity for a much more consolidated Europe. And from this point of view, at least for me, there are two things that are going to be of critical importance. One is the next elections in Poland. Mm. Because when we talk about polarization, in a certain way, Poland is as polarized uh, as uh, the United States are. And there is a very strong in my view, uh, pro-European bloc within Poland. And this bloc is uh, as determined when it comes to the supporting Ukraine as the current government. So the Polish elections of next year can turn to be one of the most important uh, Indeed, Ivan, uh, if I could just interrupt for a moment, you've gone as far I, in a Financial Times interview I read as to yeah. saying they could determine the future of the European Union. And you've also said that Germany's relationship with Poland will be as important to the European Union's future as the Franco-German relationship was in the 1950s. Those are oh. quite dramatic statements. Why do you believe this is so central? Listen, it's so central for two very important reasons. One is, as a result of this war, the gravity of the European Union moved to the east. Listen, Ukraine is a big country. Uh, we slight talk and some people compare what happened uh, in Ukraine to what was happening in the Balkans in the, uh, in the 1990s. Ukraine is a country on territory bigger than France. And European Union, in a way, is now part of a war which in many respects is on the scale of what was happening in 1941 when you see the shells being uh, basically fired uh, all over Ukraine. So as a result of it, even regardless of the fact if, when, and how the Ukraine can be integrated in the European Union, European Union is going to be incredibly involved in Ukraine because just to sustain Ukraine functioning now, and I'm not talking about anything that concerns the military part, weapons or things like this, uh, Ukraine needs between five and seven billion per day, per month, in order to sustain, to continue functioning. And these costs are going to increase with the Russian destruction of their infrastructure. So from this point of view, European, uh, European East is becoming more important. Secondly, European East uh, had the feeling that it has kind of a more moment of a high moral ground because the Poles, the Czechs, uh, uh, tell it the Western uh, capital says, we have been telling you about Russia. We have been telling you that Nord Stream was wrong. Your policy has failed. And we are not ready anymore to basically listen to you lecturing us or kind of in a good East European tradition. We believe that it's our time to lecture. Uh, uh, and this is, this is understandable. But from this point of view, we're going to see a certain level of rebalancing. Mm -hmm. uh, European East is is not simply one that in terms that we have been writing with Stephen Holmes simply wants to imitate the West. Basically, it wants to be much more of a policymaker. And this could be for good or for bad. It could be for good because we're going to see a much more consolidated European Union, but it also could be a much more controversial and part of the anti-German rhetoric of the current Polish government is really scary from time to time. I'm saying this because also Germany is in a different position compared to the previous crisis. If you see the financial crisis of 2009, 2010, if you're going to see the refugee crisis, Germany was much more perceived as the solution. And now Germany is at the center of the crisis. It was very vulnerable because of its dependence on the uh, on the Russian gas. Uh, it is a difficult coalition within Germany. So Germany cannot take its leadership for granted. And, and the German-French relationship probably are not at the best moment uh, uh, in the last 50 years. So from 
this point of view, we are in a moment of reinventing European Union on the level of rebalancing powers, rebalancing mm. sensitivities. Never forget that countries that founded the European Union, all of them have been former empires. So some of them, even in the moment of the founding, still acting empires. While East Europeans came out of the disintegration of the continental European empires. And these different sensibilities, different understanding of the meaning of sovereignty, all this is something to be renegotiated. If it is going to be renegotiated well, if the German-Polish relations are going to be strengthened as the result of this war, and I'm very much optimistic that this can happen, we are going to end up with a much stronger European Union. If it doesn't work well, we are going to see much more fragmentation in a certain way, political mm. paralysis. And, and just within that, and in this change context, how important for you uh, does the German Franco relationship continue to be? We're seeing it going through a very difficult period at the moment. Does it nevertheless, it was traditionally the powerhouse, the engine. Everyone always said the EU does not move forward unless the Franco German engine is working and working on all cylinders. Do you believe that notwithstanding this reconfiguration, this geographical shift, it still will be one of the central relationships within the EU? No, no, for sure. Uh, no doubt about this. And this is critically important because, listen, one of the important difference in the dimension is that German-French relations was very strong. And this was also very strong because France was able to represent in a certain way, the European uh, uh, South, and it's still going to be very important because political dynamics in places like Spain, like Italy, France looks kind of a much better position to understand some of the challenges that European Union is going to have on this front. And Germany was quite representative to a certain extent for the European East on much earlier moments because First, if you see in economic levels, basically Eastern Europe is the supply chain for the German economies. If something goes wrong with the German auto companies, there are going to be more jobs being lost in Central and Eastern Europe than in Germany. But what is happening now that within this kind of a big North uh, uh, Eastern bloc, there is a new security concerns. There was also major assumptions on which the German policies that have been based and people try to criminalize uh, many of the German policies. I do believe that they're wrong. Yes, it's true that Germany too much trusted Russia when they believed that economic interdependence means security. But honestly speaking, this was simply universalization of the success of the German experience of the previous 50 years. It didn't work with uh, Russia, it worked with many other places. Germany for a very long time basically managed to convince itself that military power does not really buy much. And now Germany is in a position to reconsider dramatically this, keeping in mind also that the relations with the United States can change dramatically also if they're going to be a different president and different type of a government there. So before the idea was that East has to change and the West is going to remain the same. And now I do believe that we're understanding that at this moment, for example, probably Germany is going to be forced to change more than some of these European countries, and this is true for France. Mm. But I still believe that the French-German relations have a critical importance that the European Union cannot function if uh, Germany Absolutely. and France are not going oh. to find a way to work together. Thank you. And one final question, if I might. You've also said uh, in previous interviews that the EU's genius, as you put it, is surviving crises, not resolving them. But can that really apply in this current watershed moment? Is survival enough for the European Union now? And if it's not, what can, must it do in order to not only survive this crisis, but overcome it and thrive in the future? Listen, I, it was Jean Monnet who basically said that European Union develops through crisis and basically the European Union is the sum of the solutions of this crisis. Of course, the war is a war and you cannot simply survive the war. You should kind of enter a peace and peace that is basically validating your values. Uh, but I like very much Adam Tu's kind of idea, which he reintroduced of the poly crisis. One of the things that is happening is that we have a different crisis that go in a different direction. And solving one of them is not giving you a guarantee that it's going to solve all others. As you see, for the moment, European Union states quite uh, unified uh, with respect to support to Ukraine and also because of the success on the military field by the Ukrainian uh, people, 
for the moment, something that till yesterday looks very much unbelievable that Ukraine can succeed to achieve its military goals is looking much more realistic. How exactly it's going to work, we don't know, but I'm much more optimistic that European Union is going to keep its unity over the Putin's winter and some of the uh, some of the expectations uh, of Moscow with respect to the European behavior uh, uh, are going to be wrong. Uh, but at the same time, it does not mean that by succeeding and winning in Ukraine, Europe is going to solve the climate crisis or that we're going to solve all our economic issues or that this automatically means that people are starting to trust their national governments and democracies. So so for the first time, the problem is that by solving well, one crisis, you're not going to solve all others. Mm. Uh, and yes, particularly when it comes to the war, surviving is not enough. Winning is better. Uh, but in my view, also what is interesting to see is that we should be much more careful to try to see how different crises that we're facing, different external and internal shocks that we face are trying to influence each other. Because the worst that can happen to Europe is that we can come with the right policies, but if people are not ready, basically, to follow their governments anymore, then the policies don't matter. And on that note, will you join me in thanking Ivan very much? Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and for a fascinating, fascinating conversation. Thank you very much indeed, Ivan. A real privilege to talk to you. So. We now want to move to another dimension of power, the power of pandemics to change the world. And I'm going to hand over uh, back to Elizabeth Kuiper, EPC Associate Director, head of its Social Europe and Wellbeing Programme, to introduce her speaker 